Hey, welcome back to Bible Basics. I'm George Willett. Uh, we are coming to the end of apologetic evangelism, this, this study that we've done, where we have already done apologetics. We've already done doctrine. We've done some of the Bible. And, and we said, let's put it all together and say, how do you go out and share this with other people? The, the gospel good news, that, that you be ready to have an answer for the hope that is within you. And, and we took this material from a book by Dr. Tim Wallingford. And the idea that as we go out, and this is what believers are supposed to do, we're supposed to go out and make disciples, we're going to run into people who have certain spiritual profiles, there's certain types of people. And we as believers have to have the understanding of where they are distorting or misunderstanding who God is, what the issues may be, so that we can have good answers for them. Now, as always, when we're profiling, even a spiritual profile, one person will not automatically fit into one of these categories in a very, very clear way. People may be a combination of these, or they may be this type of a person to different degrees. And when we look at the book, if you ever buy the book and you go through, you're going to see that, that this week and next week, I've, I've gotten the, the personalities out of order. And that's because I, I thought that it would be better to, to save these more towards the end. So, and, and I hope you'll see it as we talk about it. Today, we're going to talk about the skeptic. As always, a couple of, of reminders. John Knox, this, this wonderful theologian, you cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. If you are truly wanting to share the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the answer for our problems, that Jesus Christ is our Savior and our Lord, then you have to not be argumentative. You, you're not in this for a fight. You're in this to transform hearts. And then again, Dr. Tim Wallingford, whose book, Transforming or Turning Church Members into Disciple Makers, he says a key to bringing people to Christ is to first show God's love by our actions. Now, I'm not saying that, that street preachers who are standing on a corner have not been effective in the past. They, they, they can be. But I think the majority of our disciple-making, the majority of our evangelism, is done person to person. It's at work. It's our neighbors. It's people in our neighborhood. It's our, our family and friends. So make sure that how you live is lining up with what we're teaching about who God is. So let's get on to today, the skeptic. Who is the skeptic? Well, you know, what's a skeptic? And, and if you look, there, there's kind of two different definitions. And I, and I think this is true when we run into people. And the first is this. It, it's a person who's inclined to question or to doubt accepted opinions. You know, they're going to want answers. They're going to want evidence. They're going to want to have discussion. And I'm completely okay with talking to people like this. I understand it. I was the same way. I, I came to Christ in my 30s because I needed to find answers to some questions that I had, and I found them, and they are reasonable to me, and they line up. Now, there's a second definition to skeptic. Skepticism is an ancient or modern philosopher. Um, there's this way of thinking. It's a worldview. And this kind of a skeptic is someone who actually denies the possibility of having knowledge. It's impossible to have a rational belief in, in some areas. Um, you know, some philosophers over the years said, how do we know anything? How do I know anything outside of my own personal experience? Uh, a thought experiment one guy said once was, you know, how do you know? that you are not a vat, a head in, the, in a vat of liquid in some doctor's office somewhere, and you're just thinking all of this is real. What is the evidence? What is the proof? And this is get, this where it gets a little bit more difficult. And, and I will be honest with you, I've met people who are skeptical to this degree. No matter what you say, no matter what evidence or proof you bring, they always are going to doubt. They're always going to doubt. They're always going to doubt. They start with a worldview, and they're going to deny it's a worldview, but it very much is, that their burden of proof that they have to see is unreasonable. It is so high that what most people would accept as historical evidence or, or archaeological evidence, they just deny it completely. 
even when a consensus of experts would say, yeah, this is, this is reasonable. Oh, you're just appealing to authority. That doesn't count. You've got to show me that you have the evidence. And I'll, say, what is, what, and I'll say to them, what do you mean by evidence? What counts as evidence? A lot of times you're like hard science, empirical science, something physical that you can do an experiment on and keep getting the same results over and over and over again. And I will say to them, well, well, that's great when we're talking about a physical or natural phenomena. But you can't do that with history. We have no way to test that who Abraham Lincoln was or George Washington was or Genghis Khan was by recreating a scientific experiment. It just makes sense. And in the sciences, you can't recreate the beginning of the universe in a lab, in a scientific experiment that can be done over and over again. They have not been able to recreate an experiment that shows how life happened from non-life, from non-living chemicals and matter, and all of a sudden something happens and it becomes living. So even by their own definition, there's so much they can't even accept because they can't recreate it. You have to, when you're dealing with a skeptic, find out where they are in this. Um, there's a, an apologist, Dr. Frank Turek, and he actually has a, a famous question. He asked people that seem to be hyper-skeptical. Before he goes too deep in, he says, listen, if I'm able to give you evidence, if I'm able to give you adequate proof of Christianity, would you even be willing to believe then? And when many people say, no, even if you showed me, even if you had evidence, I still wouldn't believe. He goes, well, then we can have a conversation about so much else, but we don't need to argue about this. Sharing the gospel, we're trying to transform hearts. If someone is, is rejecting and is denying that we can even present evidence, they may not be someone that we can have fruitful discussions with. So, so be okay with stepping away from that for a season and letting the Holy Spirit work on them. And maybe at a later date, they'll be more open. So what do skeptics think about authority? Uh, again, like I said, authority, you know, where they get all of their, their, their reasons for living life or what they're going to do is, is found in empirical sciences or, and this is really interesting, some personal experience. Now those are like two opposite ends of the spectrum, but what they're saying is we need to have this, this evidence, this proof, and it needs to be repeatable and verifiable and it doesn't need to change. And then we'll say, okay, maybe that's, maybe that's real, or at least it's real for right now. Or they will say, from my 20 years of experience or from my personal experience, this is what I believe is true. And they say that without any hint of the irony of, of wow, I don't measure up to my own standards of evidence, but it's real for them. When it comes to God, most skeptics don't think that there is any good evidence for God. Um, a lot of them will say that they're personally unsure that, that anyone can even know that, that, that God would exist. So again, because you can't prove God scientifically in a laboratory with, with experiments, then, then you, you, you fail to prove that he exists. When it comes to Jesus, um, there are skeptics who will believe that Jesus existed, that Jesus was a real man, that he lived at a certain time in history, and that he maybe even had some good teachings. Um, in the news recently, in the last couple of months, um, Elon Musk, who's a big tech guy, science guy, he uh, runs Tesla and SpaceX, and he's trying to buy Twitter. He was on a, a podcast talking about faith, and he admitted that, that the teachings of Jesus, there's so much wisdom there, but he doesn't accept him as God. He doesn't accept him as his personal Lord and Savior. Then there are other people, these hyper-skeptical people, who will say that Jesus is purely a myth, that he never existed, that that people in the early first, second century made the story up, that they took mythology from all these other areas around them and they created something out of nothing. 
Now, I will say that the consensus of, of historical academic thought is without a doubt um, Jesus really did exist. And we've talked about this before in, in our apologetic study. You know, even non-believing first century historians will say, without a doubt, Jesus was a real person who really existed. And much of what we see in the, in the Gospels are confirmed in non-biblical text. He lived in this area at this time, taught, had disciples, uh, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and then afterwards his believers went around telling everyone that he rose from the dead. So understand when they're there, you're going to have to have discussions to help them see the probability of this. Well, their beliefs. Um, skeptics will often believe that this, that what they're doing is a method. It's how they come to knowledge. It's not a position or a worldview that they have. And it's really convenient because when they deny that they have a set of beliefs that predispose them or, or, or get them to believe things, even against evidence, it makes it really hard to have conversations. Well, no, no, no I'm, you, you've got to follow my method to show me proof. Even if you tell them, well, your method of proving something doesn't work for something historical. It doesn't work in archaeology. It doesn't, you know, these things are not verifiable the way you want me to do using your method. Science is good only up to the point that science can, can, can be helpful with the natural phenomena around us. It doesn't help with so many other things. But skeptics will hold on to this in a very, very forceful way. Here, here's a, a definition that I pulled. There is a, a skeptics.com, there's Skeptic Magazine, there, there's a lot of these different forums, a lot of these different websites and stuff that you can go to, people have gathered together. And when they're trying to figure out this is who we are, this is one of the statements they made. Modern skepticism is embodied in the scientific method that involves gathering data to formulate and test naturalistic explanations for natural phenomena. A claim becomes factual when it's confirmed to such an extent it would be reasonable to offer temporary agreement. Okay, now, now think about what's being said here from this, this skeptics website. All that matters is the scientific method. And even after they've gathered enough data, it only confirms temporary agreement. And why do they say temporary? Because scientific facts change. As they do more testing, as they get more knowledge, sometimes they've had to change what scientists agree is true. So now any scientific principle, anything they prove, you know, they have to say this is temporary, something in the future may change how we believe about this. Well, that's okay, again, as far as it goes, but that's going to have nothing to do with, with how we explain the historical truth of Christianity and the philosophical truth of Christianity. But when you only want to argue this way, it limits what we can do. And it goes on and it says, but all facts in science are provisional and subject to challenge, and therefore, skepticism is a method leading to provisional conclusions. Again, that's from skeptic.com. It's, it's on their, their manifesto, who they are. I hope you see that you get to understand someone who is bought into being a skeptic, that this is their way of life, that there's so much that we will have to talk to them about and we'll have to ask questions to figure out what is it they actually believe and how do they come to this belief? Because my question to them is, okay, you have this method of skepticism that you figure out truth that uses the scientific method and that this is the only right way to come to knowledge. What experiment did you do that shows you that skepticism is the only acceptable way to come to knowledge? See, skepticism is not something in the natural world. It's, it's a... It's a worldview. It's a way of thinking, a way of 
of making decisions. So it doesn't, it isn't even something you can prove scientifically, but their way of proving truth is only through scientific experiments. I know this is a lot, and this is why I waited to the end to get into skepticism and then our next topic. Please understand, this is the kind of person that a lot of Christians think they're going to run into anytime they talk to a non-believer. And the truth is, they're, they're kind of rare. Um, there are people who, the, the first kind of skepticism I talked about, they just question it and they want good evidence and, and you can convince them. But these people who are just really committed to the skeptical worldview, it is more difficult to have conversations. So what do they believe? They, think about this, death, judgment, and the afterlife. They believe that life is just about physical reality. It's, it's temporal. It's temporary existence. It's, it's all there is. And that once we die, there's nothing. After death, there's no judgment. There's no afterlife. So when we talk to them and we say, well, you know, if you don't believe, you're going to go to hell, that, that has no effect on them. They, they don't believe. Why are they worried? When they die, they die. Now, there's been a, a recent change. There's actually, and this was interesting for me, there's some modern skeptics who are, believe that there may be some kind of existence after physical death, that, that maybe there's, there's this, this naturalistic thing that our consciousness or that, that energy that, that fills us, they realize we're not just purely kind of this physical existence we have. There's a little bit more. But even then, there's no judgment. It's, it's you know, your consciousness, your, your, the electromagnetic stuff that makes you up to be who you are will survive in some way after your physical body dies. That there may be some other dimensions that that consciousness goes to. That, to me, is an interesting way for a skeptic to provide some hope for their future without ever having to come under the authority of a creator. That, that there is a God who is invested in this universe and invested in us as his creation. So again, ask people questions about what they believe and why and what evidence do they have for that. Biblical example. We go to Acts chapter 17. Paul is on a mission trip. Um, he often did this. He, he goes out and he's sharing the truth. And he has gotten into trouble in city after city after city. And he goes into the city of Athens. And he's waiting there for his friends. And this is what we read. While Paul was waiting in Athens, he was greatly distressed. This idea of distressed, he was very, very upset. Why? Because he sees that the city is full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Now, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. This is this different philosophy of how you do life, this hedonistic, you know, just feel good, or you just have to have pure reason. And they love to do nothing more than to get together and debate the big questions about life. So Paul is there talking to them, and, and some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? They, they didn't respect a lot of what he was trying to teach them. Others remark he seems to be adv advocating foreign gods. And they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Well, then you go down in, in Acts 17 a little bit more and we read this. He's talking about who Jesus is and he's talking about the resurrection. And he said, when they heard, the, these philosophers heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. He, he, he presented, and we read, if you keep reading in 17, some of those people came to belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as God in the flesh, who came and lived a perfect, sinless life, who, who taught us what it means to be in a relationship with God, who died to, to take care of our sin problem, and then rose from the dead to give us the hope of eternal life. But some of them didn't. And in talking with them, we see what it's going to be like for us. When we're talking to people who 
Um, the scripture talks about how they just love to get together and talk and talk and talk and talk about stuff. Some people will have debates with you. They'll have discussions with you, and they're not going to even care about being convinced. They just want to have the argument. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dejected. If you invest in time trying to talk to someone who is skeptical, and you find out that they're not this, this reasonable person who wants to have a discussion where they can be potentially convinced, but it's someone who has this worldview and they've got it set up in such a way that no matter what you say, no matter what you show them, they're going to reject. Because that's going to be some people and it's okay. But we still need to try to share with them. So how do you engage with a skeptic? First, figure out what kind of a skeptic are they? Is there someone that I can possibly give good reasons for that's gonna be convincing? or someone who just wants to argue. Then second, show them the probability of God. If someone wants 100% evidence proof, scientific proof, you show them instead that's not the way the world works. There's a lot of things we do in life. There's a lot of things we accept based on probability. We think this is what's gonna happen or we think this is true based on our our previous experience. So show them not that they need 100% evidence that they need a preponderance of evidence. They need something that's, that's pretty overwhelming, that, that gets them pretty far, but they're going to understand that they're not going to close that gap 100%. Show them that God is the uncaused first cause. This is going back to the scientific proof. If you want to know more about this, go to our doctrines um, playlist. In Bible, um, Bible Basics, we did a whole thing on apologetics. And we did a whole thing on doctrine explaining God and the evidence for God. That when you look at the natural universe, it sure looks like the universe was created and that anything that's created needs to have a creator. And what would the qualities of that creator be? Show that God is transcendent, that God is outside of the natural universe, that God as the one who made everything is outside of it and being outside of the universe You can't use physical, empirical science to prove him. Again, this is more philosophy, this is logic, and we can use science to see it's true and that it makes sense, but not to prove God's existence. And then again, God is the creator designer. This is another apologetic argument. The universe is too orderly, too organized. Everything is dialed in too closely. There's too much that had to happen for life to exist in the universe that it can't just happen by random chance. And if you show them this evidence, you can at least give them the tools they need, the the seeds that God's gonna use to show them who he really is. So talking to a skeptic, you need to kind of have some, some stuff. You need to be willing to do the work to get those arguments, to understand them at least on a basic level and then know where to point them to to get better evidence, to get more explanations, to help them surrender to Jesus. The last thing to do is pray. This is true for every person we ever try to evangelize to. Evangelism, saving people's souls, is not the job of a Christian. That is the work of God. God saves people. Our responsibility is to glorify God and to make disciples by teaching them about Jesus. I can't convince them apart from the Holy Spirit. So no matter how discouraged you may get, no matter how afraid you may be, thinking you can't do this, pray and trust in the work of God. All right, I hope this was helpful. I know this went a little bit longer, but God bless, and we will see you later. Take care.